Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Guyana Space Center, the Space Center of Europe, for the first launch of a Soyuz this year. Three weeks only after the successful launch of ATV, we are back in Guyana today to launch a new mission, a new constellation. This constellation is called O3B. It means that it aims at giving internet access to people living close to Equator, the O3B, the other 3 billion people. I want to thank O3B Network for its trust. This mission will allow us to launch the first four satellites of the constellations. After this mission, we will have two other missions to complete the full deployment of the constellation. Ariane Espace is very proud of uh, this mission and to have the opportunity to contribute to reduce the digital divide. I want also to thank the Russian industry, our partner on Soyuz. Everybody knows that Soyuz is one of the most reliable launchers in the world. I want to thank the satellite manufacturer, Thales Alenia Space, for the perfect preparation of the satellites. I let you now enjoy this launch. As O3B says, let the journey begin. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome. I'm Katie Haswell. We are live at the launch pad and there's Soyuz going through the final preparations. We were scheduled to launch yesterday but we postponed due to the weather and now we are planning to lift off in around 17 minutes. You can see the countdown on the top right hand side of the screen. All eyes are on the status panels before launch. Here we are in mission control. You can see them there on that screen. A bit like the dashboard in the car, they are all green, so we are go for launch. This is Mission Control, the nerve centre of operations. Folk here call it Jupiter. We have four passengers on board. The first batch of the O3B constellation. Talisalenia Space built them for O3B networks and they're full of clever technology. Another Soyuz left the pad of the Russian Cosmodrome an hour and a half ago, incidentally, carrying an Earth observation satellite. Soyuz is made of four parts. We call them stages. The first stage is the boosters. There are four of them. They weigh 178 tons each. Second stage, the central core stage, or often known as the Block A. That's about nine storeys high, the height of a nine-storey building. The third stage is often known as the Block I. Mass at liftoff, 27.8 tonnes. And the fourth stage is the frigate upper stage. Its mass at liftoff, 7.5 tonnes. And it's encapsulated inside the fairing along with the satellites. You can think of the launcher as two separate vehicles. Soyuz is the first three stages. It gets us into space and powers us for the first nine minutes. But frigate does the delicate stuff. It delivers the satellites where they need to go. This is the flight directorate, uh, Ariane Space Top Management, headed by the new CEO of Ariane Space, Space Stefan Israel. These guys take all the important decisions in the event of unplanned situations and teams working across the base report directly to them in real time. So you'll see them on the phones throughout the mission, keeping in touch with everybody. And we have joint Russian and European teams working side by side because Soyuz is, of course, a Russian-built vehicle. Now, we don't have a launch window today, but we do have two options for launch time. If teams feel the need for some extra time, we can reset the clock and launch exactly 33 minutes later. And it gives us that extra bit of flexibility. The satellites are inside the launcher waiting for liftoff. They're right at the very top of the launch vehicle. There it is, the nose of the vehicle. We call it the fairing. There are four satellites in there attached 
to the dispenser. The whole thing is known as the upper composite. And if we were to put our X-ray glasses on, this is what we would see. Frigate at the bottom and the four satellites attached. For O3B networks, the mission is telecommunications and internet. Each one weighs 700 kilograms. That's roughly the, si the size of a smart car. They're going to be in low Earth orbit. Medium Earth orbit, rather. We have low Earth orbit, medium and geostationary. And they are going to be in medium Earth orbit. Conditions are very carefully controlled there inside the fairing. Nice and cool. The satellites are in their flight configuration sitting in first class. They've got their seat belts on. Here are the O3B teams, high levels of concentration. During this phase before launch, some people have been working on the O3B project for many years. I have no doubt that everyone's feeling the intensity of the moment right now. O3B is an important mission for Arian Space, who are no strangers to launching constellations. The spacecraft in the Global Star Network were launched on board Soyuz. The O3B satellites carry revolutionary technology and they'll deliver broadband and mobile at fibre speed. This afternoon on the fifth Soyuz launch from French Guiana, we will be launching four satellites for a new constellation for a new satellite operator, O3B. Developed by Thales in Cannes and built by Thales in Rome, each satellite weighs 700 kilos and has a lifetime of 10 years. These satellites will be able to provide low latency, bulk capacity internet capability between 45 degrees north and 45 degrees south. The four satellites are fixed to a cylindrical carbon fiber structure the dispenser, itself bolted down to the Fregat upper stage of the launch vehicle. Once Fregat reaches the injection orbit at 7,833 kilometers above Earth, the satellites are separated two by two in a specific sequence. OCB then takes control of the satellites for their final deployment. We believe that it is important to provide new satellite operators such as O3B with reliable launch opportunities built on our past experience. We have been working very closely with O3B and Talis in this program. I would like to give particular thanks to Bob Morris, who will be following the satellite deployment in Cannes, and Andreas Dulaveris here with us today. Finally, I would like to thank all the teams from Talis, the CSG, Astrium, NPO Lavoshkin, TSKB Progress, and Senki and their associates for their hard work and professionalism that makes this launch possible. And he's absolutely right. You can't launch and build a satellite constellation without um, a huge dollop of teamwork. This is the uh, chef de mission, the... Uh, Mission Director from Marianne Space tonight, it's Philippe uh, Roland. And the Range Operations Manager is uh, Damien Simon. He is the one who announces, makes all the announcements. Now, we have heard, uh, we, as you heard, we always... Météo, arrêt du temps des comptes sur rouge, météo. And he's just announced um, an important uh, stop in the clock for the moment. As I mentioned, we've always had two options for our launch time today. We had the first option, which was 3.54 local time. That's 18.54 uh, universal time. And it would appear that we have now decided to choose the second option, which is 33 minutes later at 4.27 local time here in French Guiana, which is seven, uh, 1927 universal time. So this gives us a chance to check things like weather and uh, choose the best conditions. It means that we have that extra little bit of flexibility and uh, leeway. Just to remind you, we're on the edge of the Amazon rainforest on the northeastern coast of South America in French Guiana. We're very close 
to the equator. It's uh, hot and it's humid. It's coming to the end of the raining season and it has been a little bit cloudy. Uh, we have had a little bit of rain over the last few days. One of the advantages of launching from the CSG here is that we don't actually get great big tropical storms. However, the weather does change very quickly here. Rain certainly is not a problem, it doesn't stop a launch, but we do have to monitor other things like uh, the winds at altitude. So uh, we're going to take a break now and let some of those winds die down. Yesterday we had to postpone because of them, so we'll see how things progress today. And if all goes well, the countdown should start again at uh, minus 11, 11 minutes before launch. And we'll come back to you uh, a couple of minutes before that, around 20 minutes from now so join us then À tous de DDO, programmation du report du H0 à H0 plus 33 minutes. Le temps des comptes est arrêté à moins 11 minutes. Le nouvel H0 visé est 19h27 minutes 3 secondes TU, soit 16h27 minutes 3 secondes local.
Hello again and welcome back to the Guyana Space Centre. I'm Katie Haswell and we are coming to you live from the launch pad and Soyuz is undergoing final preparations. We've stopped the clock because of the weather. If you take a look at the top right hand side of your screen you'll see that the countdown has stopped at minus 11 minutes to launch and the reason it's red is because it's stopped. Uh, we always had two options for our launch time today so this was all part of the plan. Uh, the first option was to launch at 3.54 local time here in French Guiana and that is six, uh, eight 1854 UCT, so that's uh, 654 Universal Time. And because of the weather, the teams have uh, decided to use the second option for launch time. That's the 33 minutes later option. So the launch time has now been rescheduled for 1927 UCT. That is uh, uh, 447 local time. So we're orbiting four precious passengers today. We have the first batch of the O3B constellation sitting up there inside the fairing at the top of the launch vehicle. The satellites will provide internet and mobile from space but at the speed of fibre so they are quite literally going to change the lives of a lot of people around the world. Three billion actually, other three billion O3B stands for people who presently don't have the luxury of high speed broadband that many of us take for granted. And there is the launcher on the pad. We're looking here at the Soyuz launch zone, one of the three launch zones here at the Guiana Space Centre. On the left hand side you can see the mobile gantry and this is the mission control room. We call it Jupiter here and there are the teams. It's the nerve centre of, mission con of uh, the Guyana Space Centre. What we're looking at is the boards that all the uh, mission controllers look at. And here we are looking at the very top of the launch vehicle. Our four satellites are tucked up inside the fairing. It's that part at the top. Going to listen to the range operations manager now. He's about to make an announcement. Today it's Damien Simon, our range operations manager. In French, he's called the DDO. He uh, calls out the announcements during the flight and uh, during the uh, countdown. He's the one that everybody listens to. You can see those masts on either side of the Soyuz vehicle. Reprise du temps des comptes pour nouvel âge zéro visé, 19h27 minutes 3 secondes TU. And he has announced the restart of the countdown. So we are back on track. You can see the clock has turned green again. And when we go back to the mission control room, we should hopefully see green panels. The uh, Soyuz launch vehicle is, as I said, on the Soyuz pad. We have a, a lot of different facilities here at the base. And the whole thing is known as the range. That includes the ground stations, which are dotted along the equator, which track the launcher as it flies over. And all these facilities are dispersed over a very large area, in fact, as big as the island of Martinique, if anybody knows uh, Martinique. So you can imagine that the logistics involved in everybody communicating with each other across the range are uh, quite a challenge. And that's why we need someone to call out the information. That's what the range operations does. Now, this is another important uh, facility on the range. It's the S-1B satellite buildings. It's where the teams are monitoring the satellites. We have various groups of people in here. We have the customer teams. Those are the guys and girls from O3B. And we have the folk from Talisalenia Space. They're the people who built the satellites. The satellites are linked to the ground via big cables. We call them the umbilical lines and the information travels along those cables to the teams here in the satellite f uh, facilities. It's information on things like power voltage, temperature, environmental conditions. Cool, calm and concentrated. 
Some of the other buildings on the range, well, as I said, we have three launch zones. This is one of them. This is the Soyuz launch zone. But we also launched two other vehicles from the Ghana Space Centre, Ariane and Vega. And we have the integration buildings and, of course, the uh, two control centres, launch control and mission control, which is what we're looking at now. It takes 2 hours and 23 minutes to deliver the satellites and they'll be released into space 2 by 2 to get there. Soyuz will go through a number of different phases during the flight. The launcher needs to carry a lot of propellant in order to get out of Earth's gravity. But that's heavy, so the aim is to shed weight as quickly as possible and each stage falls away as it's burnt all its fuel. Less than two minutes after takeoff, the boosters are jettisoned. Two minutes later, and the fairing goes. We're out of the atmosphere. Just under five minutes into the flight, and the second stage falls away. Followed by the third stage, four and a half minutes later. Now, Frigate ignites its engine for the first of three burns. This one lasts for about four minutes, and the second comes 23 minutes into the flight and powers us to the transfer orbit. Frigate then shuts down its engines one more time and goes into a coast phase for about an hour and 20 minutes before switching it back on again in order to circularize its orbit, ready to start the process of separating the first two satellites two hours after liftoff. The second pair will have to wait another 22 minutes while Frigate moves away and realigns the composite using its attitude control system. For O3B, the journey can really begin. During that film, we had an important moment. It's called Klutsch na Start. The automated sequence for Soyuz started around an hour and a half ago, but it's now entered the final phase of that sequence. It's the last five minutes. It's called Klutsch na Start in Russian, and that actually means key on start. At the Russian Launch Control Center, they actually do turn a real key, whereas here in French Guiana, uh, there is still a key, but it's largely symbolic. So now computers on board Soyuz are running all the final checklist and they manage an impressive list of operations. And it's the people at Launch Control who are in charge of that. Operations for Soyuz started in the Launch Vehicle Integration Building, the MIC. The first three stages were assembled horizontally, starting with the boosters, which were strapped to the second stage, followed by integration of the third stage. Meanwhile, the satellites arrived on board the specially equipped Antonov plane at Cayenne's Felix Eboué Airport. They were transported to the payload processing facility at the Guyana Space Center. Here, teams performed a series of tests to check the good health of the satellites in the utmost cleanliness. They were then sent for fueling operations before attaching the four of them using a special dispenser system. The dispenser and the satellites were then transferred to the S3B building, where they were integrated onto the frigate upper stage. The whole thing was carefully hoisted and encapsulated inside the protective case of the fairing to form what is known as the Upper Composite. After a series of review meetings, the first three stages of the Soyuz vehicle were transferred horizontally to the pad on its launch table using specially designed rails which took around an hour. Soyuz was then raised to a vertical position inside the mobile gantry which protects it and provides feed lines until it's retracted one hour before launch. The upper composite, that's the fairing with the satellites, frigate and the dispenser inside, was then transported to the pad. There they were hoisted on top of the Soyuz and mated with the third stage that same day. The fluid and electrical connections were then activated along with the air conditioning inside the fairing. And all this thanks to great teamwork. So Klutschna Start has now started and we're into the final phase of the countdown. You see that white smoke, that's actually liquid oxygen evaporating because uh, it's kept at such low temperatures. The first three stages of Soyuz are powered by liquid oxygen and kerosene, but to keep oxygen as a liquid 
we need to store it at remarkably low temperatures. Minus 183 degrees to be precise, that is very cold. The main stage is actually grey and the reason it looks white is because uh, it's frosting over. Now we talked about uh, the launch control center earlier and these are the teams working there. We have two teams in launch control. On each side there are two more teams because we have a two-way cooperation between the Russians and the Europeans for Soyuz. One team is led by the launch site operations manager, today it's Sebastien Davier. And uh, they're responsible for the ground operations. And on the Russian side, it's Alexander Chervan. And the other team is led by the Ariane Space Production Manager. Tonight, it's Mark Wa. And they are responsible for the flight readiness of the vehicle. In Baikonur, launch control is actually in several bunkers, which are underground, about 50 meters from the pad. Whereas here at the Guyana Space Centre, it's actually in a protected building which is about one kilometre from the pad in very modern uh, facilities. Now, you can see that big grey metal mast to the right-hand side of the launcher. It's called the KZM, the Upper Composite Umbilical Mast. Inside it are all the umbilical lines which are taking information from the satellites to the teams on the ground. Those lines are being disconnected. We can't actually see them because they're inside the mast. But the range operations manager is announcing it. The upper composite has sent the drop-off command. And you'll see that KZM mast retracting or pulling away just before launch. Watch out for that. Below it's another mast. It's called the VKM or lower stage mast. We can't actually see that right now, but it's connected to the equipment bay of the Block A. That's the second stage. And it houses all the electrical links providing communications between the ground and the Block A. And that will retract shortly after the KZM. Quick word about ignition. Soyuz also carries people into space, and so we need the utmost safety, and there's a system for checking the health of the engines before it leaves the pad. The engines on the four boosters and the core stage are ignited 16 seconds before liftoff, and the thrust is then gradually increased to check that everything is working fine. Then they are throttled up to full thrust, and Soyuz lives, leaves the pad. So, uh, a couple of things to watch out for then before the launch. The KZM mast will pull away and uh, the disconnection of the Soyuz third stage umbilical lines then at 18 Attention seconds to Attention pour H0 -1 minute. VKM, he's announcing one minute. Stop. H0 -1 minute. We are one minute to launch. We're orbiting the first four satellites in the O3B constellation built by Tanis Elenia Space for O3B networks and we are flying on board the fifth Soyuz to launch from its new home here at the Guyana Space Centre. 40 seconds to launch, we're switching to onboard power. Watch out for the big metallic Stop. mast, there Ariane it goes. And don't forget to count to 16 once you see the first burn of the engines. A0 moins 20 secondes. Top, largage ma VKM. Top, allumage triétage. A12 de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, unité. Ousk, décollage. We are off, hauling ourselves against the gravity of the Earth, all 310 tons. 
We're heading out east over the Atlantic Ocean and we are burning five engines. Everything's going according to plan, he says. We have one on the core stage and we have one on each booster. But it's the boosters which are doing all the work right now. Their job is to get us away from the Earth. Gravity makes us stick to our planet and stops us flying off into space. But it also makes it very hard for us to leave and we need lots of firepower to do that. That's why we call them boosters, because they give us a short but massive boost at the beginning of the flight to quite literally push us away. They are providing 80% of our thrust right now. That's 790 kilonewtons each. Les paramètres à bord sont normaux. Look at the left-hand side of the screen. You'll see what we call the trajectory. All lies on that. La propulsion du premier et du deuxième étage est dominale. Everything's going well. The all eyes on that uh, after launch, before it was the status panels. The uh, curve is the computer simulation of the scheduled altitude. The white dot on the curve is the actual position of the launch vehicle. A is the altitude and V is the velocity, the speed. So we are losing those boosters. They've burnt all their propellant. We don't need them anymore, so they fall back to Earth. And we're shedding weight. And we have confirmation of that. The lighter they are, we are, the faster we go. It's a basic law of physics. Sir Isaac Newton discovered it. It's called the first law of dynamics. It helps us to understand gravity, and most rocket science is based on it. I'm sure that uh, Sir Isaac Newton would be delighted to be watching this powerful machine defeating gravity. So we're burning the main core stage. It burns uh, for just under five minutes and if you look at the bottom left hand side of the screen you can see that it's uh, a hammerhead shape and that's to accommodate those boosters. Everything's going normally. A word about the confirmations of major events in the flight. We're seeing things happening at the right time. But we get uh, actual confirmations of those milestones very slightly later. That's uh, perfectly normal. It takes a little time for the information to get to the Les range operations manager. And he calls out those confirmations when he gets them. We're traveling at a speed of 2.36 kilometers an hour. And we're going faster and faster. We are climbing higher and higher, 104 kilometers above the Earth. Look at the top of the vehicle. That's the fairing. It has several jobs. Most notably, it's protecting the satellites from the rigors of the launch. The acoustic vibrations at liftoff, it's very loud. And friction, the launch is flying through the dense part of our atmosphere at very high speeds. So the outside of the fairing gets just a little bit hot. And uh, we are losing the fairing. We don't need it anymore. And the reason is because we're on the outer edge of the atmosphere now, which is about 100 kilometers deep. So any remaining gas up there is so thin. The satellites are now safe from the effects of friction. And we've had the confirmation. We've lost the fairing. The captain has switched off the seatbelt signs. And we can see our four babies for the first time. The gold structures are, o, are the O3B spacecraft. You can see the blue bits are the solar panels. It's incredible to think that it's taken us less than four minutes to get into space. It would take you an hour if you were driving by car. It's nothing, is it, really? Makes you realize how small and fragile our atmosphere is. Makes life possible here on Earth, but there's not much of it. So we'd better look after it. We're losing the second stage. It's switched off its engine and it's fallen away. On Soyuz, the engine igni ignition of the third stage is just a little bit different uh, from Ariane, if you're familiar with Ariane flights. With Ariane, we separate... With Ariane, we separate one stage before switching on the next. Uh, with Soyuz, it's the other way around. We switch on the third stage before switching off the engine on the second stage. And that's why we have a latticework structure in the middle of the vehicle. To separate the stages, we use pyrotechnic bolts and a set of springs, which literally ping the satellite away. And those are the same pyrotechnic charges that are used by airbags in your car, which is just one of the many spin-offs from space which have changed our lives here on Earth. 
We're looking at computer-generated images on the bottom left-hand side of the screen there. They're showing us what the experts have calculated is happening to the launcher and the satellites. Basically, the teams plan a very precise schedule of events based on extremely accurate predictions, and they put all of that information into the computer. And these beautiful images are a simulation of those predictions. So quite literally every movement and every position that you see is based exactly on what has been planned for the flight. So the uh, everything's going according to plan. So take a look on the left-hand side of the screen. V, the velocity, we are travelling at 4.55 kilometres per second. 179 kilometers above the Earth. The Paris Air Show ended yesterday, and as always, it was an extremely busy event. The Paris Air Show was a great success. This sector of French economic activity is particularly dynamic. And this 50th international aerospace event at Le Bourget Airport received a number of important guests, including the French President François Hollande and the Prime Minister Jean-Marc Ayrault. During the week, a succession of guests from the French political and economic scene toured the event and learned about the latest technologies in the aerospace world. Iron Space Chairman and CEO Stéphane Israel outlined the company's role as a worldwide launch provider. For Ariane Espace, this Paris Air Show is the first where we come with our three launchers now fully operational from our Guyana Space Center CLG. We have Ariane 5, we have Soyuz, we have Vega. It was not the case two years ago. This is the first point. The second one is the fact that we have had a very, very good beginning of the year. We have registered nine contracts, eight for IN5, one for Vega, and it is one of the best beginning of the years we have ever had. The third point, as ever, Le Bourget is a unique place to meet our partners, to meet industry, to meet institutions, and for sure our customers. The show opened with a contract signing for IN Space, who Telespazio has chosen to orbit Gok Turkwan for the Turkish government. Our flight path takes us east across the Atlantic and along the equator. We're tracking the launcher using ground stations. It's called telemetry. Soyuz sends data to those stations as it flies over and it tells us how the flight is progressing in real time. We've just picked up the signal at the ground station in Brazil. We have a number of ground stations, Galio here at the Guyana Space Center, Metal in Brazil, and uh, Ascension Island, which is in the middle of the Atlantic, Libreville, which is in Gabon on the west coast of Africa, and Malindi on the east coast of Africa, that's Kenya. And then we finish with South Point in Hawaii, which will track separation of the satellites. So the third stage engine is now scheduled to shut down. You can see it there as it separates and moves away. And we're now beginning the next phase of the journey. This is where Frigate takes the wheel. Frigate's that gold structure you can see on the left-hand side of the satellites. It's actually a, a spherical structure. It has six tanks. And we have confirmation there of separation of the third it has six spherical tanks organized in a circle, uh, four for propellants, two for avionics, that's what you would normally find in the cockpit of a plane, that's the flight control systems, navigation, communications, that kind of thing. And the satellites are attached using the adapter, we can see that circle on the right of the satellites, that's actually a tube which is attaching them. Frigate's getting ready to switch on its engine. It's called the pre-burn phase. It gives a quick burst of acceleration to push the fluids back in the tanks to make sure that it ignites properly. And there we go. It has switched its engine on for its first burn. It's going to last just under four minutes. Frigate is a bit like a sophisticated taxi driver. Its job is to deliver our satellites to their drop-off point in space. 
It's going to take a couple of hours to get there, and during that time, we have three propulsion phases. The first two burns take us to the transfer orbit, and then we have a coast phase. This is the fourth launch of the year from the Guyana Space Center, so everyone's been very busy. On the 5th of June, Ariane 5 successfully launched the fourth ATV cargo vessel, Albert Einstein, for the European Space Agency. At 20 tonnes, it's the heaviest load Ariane 5's ever lofted. She released the cargo ship 420 kilometres above the Earth to continue its journey to the International Space Station. The control centre at the French space agency, CNES, then took control of Albert Einstein. After a 10 days journey, it docked with the space station with perfect precision, just like its three predecessors. Astronauts then unloaded the supplies. Tokyo, 7th of June, and a partnership agreement between Arian Space and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, sealed by Mitsubishi's chairman Hideki Omiya and Arian Space's Jacques Breton. Cooperation between Japan's space industry and Arian Space goes back 20 years. This latest agreement moves that partnership one step further. We have worked a lot with our Japanese clients, and we have already captured 64% of the Japanese markets. We have signed 27 launch contracts, which means that since we started our Tokyo office, we have signed more than one a year. So for Iron Space, Japan is a very important market and it promises the development of new partnerships. Back in French Guiana, an AlphaSat is getting ready for launch for Inmarsat. Based on Europe's mighty Alphabus platform, it is the most sophisticated communication satellite to date. Joining it on board Ariane 5 in July is Insat3D for the Indian Space Research Organization. This Earth observation satellite will help with storm warning and search and rescue. Starsem has appointed Stefan Israel as CEO of the European-Russian joint venture. Israel took over from Jean-Yves Le Gall to head up Ariane Space in April. So you can see there we have acquisition of signal by the uh, tracking station in Ascension Island, which is an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So we took off from northeastern coast of South America. The Guyana Space Centre is uh, in French Guyana, which is on the edge of the Amazon rainforest. We're now halfway across the Atlantic Ocean. We're coming up to 14 minutes into the flight, and the upper stage is powering us towards the west coast of Africa. Before, we were using all our power to get away from the Earth, but now we're using it to go faster and faster, so that later in the flight, we can go higher and higher. And look how fast we're going. 7.29 kilometres per second, and we are climbing. Right now we are at 188 kilometres above the Earth. We have the scheduled first frigate cutoff of the engine. The onboard computer is sending the command to switch off the engine. And frigate is now entering the first ballistic phase. It's going to last eight and a half minutes. Ballistic actually means without propulsion. It means that we're now travelling high enough and fast enough to cruise without the engine and then Frigate will reignite its engine later on to take us to our transfer orbit. Frigate's a very fascinating piece of kit actually uh, because it was originally designed as an interplanetary probe and it was adapted to fly on board Soyuz. So it is an orbital vehicle in its own right and it's totally anonymous. It quite literally has to think for itself. It has its own onboard computer with guidance navigation control. It has its own tracking and telemetry systems, and it can restart its engine up to 20 times. 
That's very useful for Ariane Space because it means that uh, they can offer their customers tremendous flexibility because frigates can take its passengers quite literally wherever they need to go. The O3B satellites are going to medium Earth orbit. <laughs> The launch of O3B's first satellites ushers in a new era of communications. For billions of people around the world, it will change the way they live, communicate and do business. The premise behind the O3B concept was to solve the problem of emerging markets connectivity, to really allow entrepreneurs on the ground to allow telecoms, to allow internet service providers to have high speed, low latency access that they could then provide to their customer base. The system will connect roughly three billion people on the face of the earth in a way that they have never had the capacity to be connected before. The O3B satellites are Middle Earth orbit spacecraft, far closer and more capable than traditional communications satellites. Data transmitted via the O3B network will happen more than four times faster. In their lower orbit, the O3B satellites move faster than the Earth rotates, so the secret to constant connection is the smart way that O3B's strategically positioned gateways around the world track the spacecraft across the sky and constantly link the global network. O3B is, is a really cool and elegant ballet, and it's, it's beautiful in its simplicity. It might look complex if you just look at it the first moment, but everybody who scratched the surface says, wow, it's very, it's actually very simple. The satellites provide coverage everywhere within 45 degrees north and south of the equator, reaching vast areas of the planet where broadband connectivity is most needed. It's perhaps no surprise then that even well in advance of the launch, uptake of O3B's planned service has been phenomenal. We've signed customers in every region of the world and we've sold every product that we've launched so far, which reinforces what I think we all know to be true, which is the demand for high quality, affordable bandwidth on a global basis is insatiable. Telco and trunking is really where it all began for O3B. The first customer that we're gonna be lighting up on the system is Telecom Cook Islands way out in the Pacific, who've been largely bypassed by fiber up to this point, and that's all about to change as we open the pipe and deliver more than six times more capacity than the Cook Islands have had up to this point. I think it's gonna be life-changing for the Cook Islanders. We followed that same approach with Astica in American Samoa and Digicel in Papua New Guinea. And we've also seen great take up of our trunking products in Africa, in DRC, in South Sudan and in Madagascar. And also in Latin America in some of the hardest places to reach in the world in the middle of the Colombian and Brazilian Amazonas. Then Maritime, we're hugely excited to be working with Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean operate the two largest and most innovative cruise ships in the world and we're going to be able to increase by almost 100 times the amount of bandwidth on board. I think the guests are going to just find that an amazing experience. In the energy market, the need for low latency is paramount. Hundreds of miles offshore, applications just need to work, and that's what O3B can do. And in mobile, we're going to be part of the mobile data explosion as mobile network operators are looking to deploy data services further out into the network. We've just announced a groundbreaking new deal with a company called Majanusa in Malaysia who are going to deploy the first large 3G network over satellite in the world. Once our system is up, all these ISPs and networks around the world that I've already acquired or, or put in the, the ground stations and are ready to turn on the system. Once we turn on, they turn off the old geosynchronous links and all of a sudden all of their customers across the board have incredible increases in speed and lower latency and a more enjoyable experience. So it's really just boom and all of a sudden your internet's much better. For operators, O3B Networks provides the ability to deliver new and improved services into many new markets. And for billions of people around the world, it will, at last, change the way they live, communicate, and do business. Every single person in O3B, every investor, has said, we need to make this happen. This is, more, this is bigger than us. It's about doing something for the world. And this is our impact, our, our thing that we can do to help the other three billion, to help all these other people in the world get access and become part of it. So much has already happened in O3B's short life. 
but this launch is really where it all begins. There's huge excitement about what we're going to be able to achieve in the future, but it's matched with an unerring determination to deliver on the promise that we've made to all our customers. Four satellites are being launched in June. Another four will go up probably the last week in August. We're building four more right now, and we'll continue that program of building and launching satellites for the indefinite future. The system is ultimately scalable. You just, you can build it as large as you want. Um, I can see a time in the future where O3B will become the largest satellite company in the world. And the founder, Greg Weiler, will be joining me in the commentary box later. I'm really looking forward to hearing from him how he and the chairman, John Dick, came up with the idea in the first place and, and actually made it happen. So we're flying out. Um, we're arriving now on the west coast of Africa. That was the mission director. And there's Greg in uh, the uh, Jupiter uh, control room. Uh, and we've crossed the Atlantic in only 21 minutes. And uh, just think, it's taken us uh, 20 minutes to cross the Atlantic. It takes six hours in a jumbo jet. All thanks to the principle of suborbital flight, a combination of speed and altitude. You never know, soon we might be able to do London to Sydney in three hours. That would be something. So uh, the reason for the coast phase is to save on uh, propellant and also optimize the conditions of the flight. There we are, flying out across the coast of Africa. And uh, we can see down there the, uh, the sea. And we're looking at the four satellites attached to frigate. It's now going uh, through its pre-burn phase and it's about to ignite. There we, ha there we have it. It's ignited its engine. It's going to burn for just under nine minutes now. So until now we've been using all our power to go faster and faster but now we really need to start going higher and higher and that's why we've switched our engine back on because we need to climb towards our transfer orbit and to do that we need to build up more speed. Look at the curve. You can see that we started off really climbing very very high then we sort of plateaued out um, while we're in the coast phase and you can see that we're then going to start climbing again. Look at the V for uh, velocity, 7.43 kilometers per second at 172 kilometers above the earth. Those speeds are really remarkable and uh, I think they're quite difficult to digest actually, Seven, uh, nearly 8 kilometers per second. Let's see if we can put those into perspective. The fastest man is Usain Bolt, although the American Justin Gatlin is certainly giving him a run for his money. He uh, runs roughly at 10 metres per second. The fastest car, roughly 100 metres per second. I'll leave you to imagine what that might be. Sound travels at 330 metres per second. A bullet travels at nearly um, 100 kilometres a hundred meters per second, a thousand meters per second, uh, one kilometer. And Soyuz right now is traveling eight times faster than a speeding bullet. There'll be 12 satellites in the O3 constellation. Talas Alenia Space is in charge of building them all. O3B is without a doubt a pioneering and ambitious project that will be a major event in the history of satellites activity and that will play a key role in the growth of worldwide economy. It's a great honor for Thales Alenia Space to have participated to this project and to be O3B's prime industrial partner. We are very proud to have equipped these satellites with the most advanced technology to offer unique operational and beam flexibility. Those satellites will provide low latency, high speed link to more than 3 billion people who had so far limited broadband access. This project has been really challenging for the Telesania space teams and certainly will increase our expertise and experience with it. I would like to underline the outstanding spirit of partnership between all our teams 
at tasks, and those are for freebie and the permanent support we got from our customer. Thanks to our freebie and the professionalism of Thales Alenia Space teams, we achieved the development of the satellite with success. Today is a major event for our freebie since it marks the beginning of the implementation phase with the first batch of four satellites. But it is not the end of the story, by far, and we will continue to fully support our freebie to make this constellation a great success. Once again, congratulations to my team for their fantastic job and warmest thanks to our freebie for their trust. You can count on us. Good luck to everyone. Bye-bye. We've picked up the uh, signal at the tracking station in Malindi. We're heading out over the east coast of Africa now. So, uh, Talas Alenia Space, interestingly, is prime contractor for three constellations, actually, of telecom satellites, uh, Global Star, Iridium, and O3B. So, if you add them all together, I think that they've been working on something like 117 satellites, all of about the same size and weight, which is pretty impressive. Uh, they ha certainly have a lot of experience in this field, and uh, they're used to creating... Uh, platforms. They've made a new one. It's called Elite Bus. All satellites are made up of two parts. There's the platform and the payload. The payload is what carries the instruments, but the whole lot rides on board the platform. It's also known as the bus, and this new platform, Elite Bus, is very versatile. It can be adapted for a wide range of missions to LEO, MEO, and GEO. And most importantly for the people who fly it, it's easy to use. Andreas Dulveris is the Satellite Mission Director for the O3B Satellites. He's been working with the teams at TASS. As fibre is limited throughout the world, O3B will be deploying a constellation of satellites providing broadband connectivity everywhere on the Earth from within 45 degrees latitude north and south of the equator. As we are launching four satellites at a time, it is very important to have the ability to accommodate not only the four satellites, but also the ground support equipment. Knowing that Air and Spas has the experience with launching a constellation like Global Star, which has a very similar platform as O3B, and along with Air and Spas's excellent track record, we feel that this is the right choice for O3B. The Soyuz has been ideal for the first block O3B satellites. The Soyuz provides the capability to launch four O3B satellites into an altitude of 7,333 kilometers. This is important because this allows O3B to deploy and start service as soon as possible. This also allows O3B to reduce launch costs on a per satellite basis. I have been extremely pleased as the launch campaign has gone extremely smooth. This is a testament to all the participants who have supported this campaign, which includes the satellite manufacturer, Talis Alenia Space, the launch provider, Arian Space, the rocket provider, Air and Space's Russian partners, and of course, the CSG staff. I would like to provide a special thanks to Philippe Roland, who postponed his retirement in order to make sure that the first O3B launch would be successful. This shows the dedication and the type of people that Aaron's boss employs in order to make these launch operations happen. So we've left the east coast of Africa behind us and we're flying out now uh, across the Indian Ocean towards Southeast Asia. We will be uh, crossing those beautiful paradisiac islands of the Seychelles and Maldives over Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, out across uh, the South Pacific, back towards the northwest coast of South America. So we will have done a full lap of the Earth in a couple of hours. Not bad, huh? 
It's looking darker and darker. That's because we're climbing higher and higher into space. Look at the curve. We're really going up now. Look at the A for altitude, 244 kilometers above the Earth, and climbing, 8.45 kilometers an, uh, uh, a second, the V for velocity there. And we can see the curvature of the Earth. Quite beautiful. That small blue line is the atmosphere. Frigate's shortly going to shut down its engine for about an hour and 20 minutes, and then it will reignite it to get us to the separation orbit. But while it's in its next coast phase, it's going to go into what we call a barbecue mode. That means that it's literally going to rotate as if on a spit, and that's to ensure the homogeneity of thermal conditions around the satellites. So Frigate is now scheduled to switch off its engine, and it's now going into the next ballistic phase, uh, which is going to last for about one hour and 20 minutes. We're going to lose telemetry, uh, we're going to lose visibility of the launcher for just over 42 minutes during that time, it's all part of the plan, means that we'll go out of the range of the tracking stations and we'll pick up the signal again at the ground station in Hawaii at South Point where Frigate will say aloha. We're going to take a break now and come back in a few minutes. Uh, a few minutes uh, before frigate uh, switches its engine back on, it's going to be then getting ready to separate the first two satellites. Uh, before we go, let's just watch the launch again. We lifted off from the Soyuz pad just uh, over half an hour, 32 minutes ago, from the Guyana Space Center. It was a beautiful launch and everything went smoothly and according to plan. So, we will be coming back to you just before Frigate switches its engine back on again at uh, 8.40 Universal Time. That's 9.40 in the UK, 10.40 Jersey and France, 1.40 LA, I believe, and 5.40 local time here in Kourou. We'll see you again later.